he when he's close to dying at one point he gathers his disciple and he says uh, after i die i know some of you are going to take to the mountains to meditate some of you are just going to party with women and he goes both types of zen are fine with me but if you become a yeah. professional cleric and start babbling about the zen as the way then you're my enemy I want to get into your fantastic kick-ass podcast, History on Fire, and in, uh, specifically the series on EQ Sojin. Oh, yeah. And, and, oh, and you, de you dedicated two episodes to the unconventional life of EQ Sojin uh, for the first episode titled Sex, Zaki, and Zen. You actually shared an image of Ikkyu Sojin drinking wine off of a lady's boob, All and right. after listening to the episode, that is a uh, you know perfect way to depict the release of his story. So I wanted to ask you for people who may not have heard of Ikkyu, who is Ikkyu Sojin, and what makes him one of your all-time idols? So Ikkyu was born at the end of the 1300s in Japan. He was, uh, almost certainly, he was the legitimate son of the emperor of Japan. However, mm. because he was illegitimate, he ended up, uh, his, and also his mom was a little worried that they may try to get rid of him because she was getting pushed off court. So she put him in a Zen monastery when he was five, which, you know, kind of a hard life. You're a little kid, you are completely estranged from your dad. You are essentially also estranged from your mom since she puts you in a monastery and only you get to see her once mm -hmm. in a while. Monasteries, they are not exactly the most cheerful place for a little kid to grow up in. So, you know, he has his struggles. And uh, the funny thing about him is that he has uh, clearly an incredible grasp of Zen Buddhism. But because he has such an incredible grasp of Zen, he tends to clash with the Zen establishment. Because he feels that mm. they have turned Zen into a bureaucracy. They have turned it into this thing that was lifeless and in some way the opposite of what Zen is supposed to be. So he regularly and, clashed with them and eventually mm. he just flat out broke with a lot of the Zen hierarchy and became a wandering teacher where he would... Uh, teach about his way of life, had a humongous effect on the, on the cultural history of Japan since uh, many of his disciples played a key role in the development of many Japanese arts and just had a blast of a life. You know, his passions were in no particular order, Zen, women and drinking. And, mm. you know, some of it sound provocative, but some of it was just his approach was like, look, Zen at its roots, Zen is a way of perceiving reality it's a way of being it's a presence so mm. doing uh, zen is not just sitting cross leg with clouds of incense in a monastery that just the stereotype is like you yeah. saying you can have a certain degree of consciousness in anything you do and as long as you're not a dick about it as long as you behave semi-decently it's not what you do that makes you or doesn't make you spiritual is the attitude you bring to things mm. and He's just funny. Like so much of his stuff is just uh, hilarious because he's defying social conventions, but without the teenage edginess of the guy who's trying to prove how different he is. More just because he feels social con some social conventions are stifled and needlessly rigid. So he, yeah. I, go ahead. I was I was gonna say that one of the the funny moments from the podcast was. Bur him burning the certificate of enlightenment sure. and just basically like taking taking this this piece of paper that in a lot of ways is like a college degree you know you you yeah. spend a lot of energy time and money uh ch trying to achieve this thing that ultimately is a piece of paper that you present at the first job you have and then after that like no one gives a shit you know college is yeah. all about the friends and relationships that's right. basically the only thing that that is lasting and meaningful from it and you learn you learn things as well you have great professors great teachers but the the actual certificate is not uh mm -hmm. super meaningful and then 
listening to the the moment where EQ basically just fucking lights this certificate yeah. on fire that all his uh you know for lack of a better word classmates uh monk monk mates mm -hmm. i'm not sure the the sure. exact term for it but they're just like what like what is this guy doing like i would yeah. die for this thing that he's just burning right in front of me and just yeah. walks out like it's nothing to me i was like wow this this dude uh it, it would have been a wild uh like a wild sort of wisdom wisdom to be around this guy yeah, and the thing that one of the reasons why I enjoy doing the two episodes about him is because so often history is a history of warfare and bloodshed, and many of the people I pick, even though they may be wonderful human beings in some way, they are usually highly disturbed characters in one way or another. There's something that mm. it is a breath of fresh air because it's a guy who just enjoyed life. There's not that, I mean, he goes through stuff early on, but eventually it gets to a point where there really is not much drama. He, he you know, usually you don't make a podcast about just somebody who enjoys life because it doesn't feel like there's a story to tell. So many of our stories are built on conflict. Mm. But it's uh, something else because he can make you feel like you're listening to an extremely exciting life, even though there are, you know, no battles, no bloodshed, none of the classic things that people tend to focus on. And so it's a healthy reminder that sometimes an intense and beautiful life doesn't have to be all about drama. And, uh, and I love that. I think that's one of the best, uh, lessons that one can get from it is really just the ability of the guy to have a great life yeah and and some of it is is shock and awe with with some of the the stories that he tells about brothels and, and hanging out at bars and he has some very uh sexual poetry and it's also very practical and it made me think about my own upbringing in the catholic church you know, going to church every sunday you're basically hardwired with this instilled guilt for anything that's considered a sin, sure. which is, you know, like if you or anyone's hand gets within two inches of a private part, you know, you can't even smell alcohol, like all, all this like super intense guilt that you don't really know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. And I also went yeah. to Catholic high school too. So it was just like constantly. And, you know, once you, once I became a teenager, once I'm, uh, you know, hooking up with people, drinking, like actually being a human being, there was something in my mind that was going, yeah, I think like, I don't think this is wrong. I, th I think this is, you know, I'm learning a lot through these experiences mm -hmm. that are quote unquote sinful. And I learn a lot more doing these things than, you know, falling asleep in mass eating a wafer and mm -hmm. then saying, you know, Hail Mary 10 times uh, because I jerked off the night before, whatever it was. And it's uh, the, the stories of Ikkyu going to the brothels and the bars and, and feeling more mindful, uh, you know, hanging around beautiful women and people that were considered the outcasts of society. That really resonated with me because I've, I've, uh, you know, I, I haven't, gained as much experience as him or, or yourself but uh, even as a you know 18 20 year old I, I still felt like yeah i think there's something that this guilt is fucking up for a lot of people that grew up with at least catholic religion i can't speak for people in other religions because i haven't experienced that but at least catholicism instills you with a lot of guilt that prevents you from fully enjoying a ton of experiences right no, certainly. And I think that's one of the greatest uh, terrible things that many ideologies, both religious and not, have instilled in human beings is a sense of shame uh, over just the basic stuff that makes you human. You know, And it's like, mm -hmm. it's, this is not to say, because often what happens is the people who throw away the shackles and reject the shame, they often end up doing it in a way that makes you understand back to that duality we were talking about, that makes you understand why those rules were put in the first place, because they do it in a shitty, terrible way, often abusive to other people, self-destructive. And you're like, no, that wasn't the idea. You could do certain things without being a dick about it, without being self-destructive, without all that. 
there's a way it's not about the actions are terrible or not is how you do them the measure in which you do them how you carry and that makes all the difference like you don't you don't need to be this repressed freak who doesn't dare to uh, look up at something because otherwise it's all going to be sinful and destruction or be this uh, quote-unquote liberated person who's just on this self-destructive and destructive of others kind of band mm. there's a way to be more like freer without becoming an idiot you know without yeah. uh, it doesn't have to be uh, one crazy extreme or the other crazy extreme there's a very happy place somewhere in there where you can uh, uh, have the freedom without the stupidity that people sometimes bring to, to being free yeah that's a good goal in life to become a little less of an idiot every day instead yeah. of trying to become a smarter person think like am i as much of an idiot as i was yesterday okay like maybe a little bit less i'm on the right path <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, how many stories you have heard of the people who are like rejecting some of the traditional repressive bullshit that they grew up in? And the next thing they do, they become like cult leaders who use these uh, sweet lines that make sense to then take advantage yeah. of a bunch of people. It's like it's messed up. It's, uh, it's yeah. like, no, you can actually reject some stuff without turning into an abusive freak. And yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's and like I, I uh, yeah, it's like the, the some some of those people that reject religion. They're like, you know, I I don't I don't like saying words in uh, a synchronous matter with hundreds of people, and I don't like drinking stuff on command. And then they'll leave, and then go start a cult and be like, say these words when I tell you to, and then we're gonna all drink this and kill ourselves. And like, <laughs> so it is it is like a, a funny switch where it's like there there are some people that aren't against they're they're not rebelling against religion they're just creating a religion that they like better totally and i and usually where they are at the top and they gain all the benefits and yeah. it's more of a selfish thing than anything but i did another episode on um on this guy diogenes who was a greek philosopher mm. about 2400 years ago and um, and I think it's an interesting comparison to EQ because Diogenes is also hilarious, also defies social convention, also does a lot of this stuff that seem very EQ-like. But there's a big difference that he he's great when it comes to criticizing the existing order of things, doesn't seem to be all that great when it comes to creating an alternative that works. Mm. Like the great mm. thing about EQ is that he does. He cre he has this different way of living that people gravitate to. They are happy. They feel good. He's inspiring to people. He's doing a fantastic job. Diogenes is more like cracking great jokes about why the existing order of things sucks. But then when you look at like, there's nothing built on like destroying a previous oppressive order is great if this gives you freedom to create something beautiful. Mm. If you just destroy it for the sake of destroying it, it's like, well, now what? You know, what is that you bring to the table? So that one was an interesting one for me to study because on one hand, it was really fascinating. But on the other hand, it also felt like a missed opportunity. It felt like, oh man, the guy's so funny, so this is so that, but where is this going? And it doesn't feel like yeah. In fact, I called it uh, that episode, I called it the punk rocker of ancient Greece because he does have this very punk rock vibe to him, which is great in the criticism mm. of the existing order, but mm. not like all punk, but definitely a lot of it. What was the not first word? The the bank, the bank something of ancient punk. Greece? I said punk rocker, as in punk rock, the genre. Oh, punk rocker. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, though it's and, like uh, to re very punk rebelling against the power. Do you do yeah. you think di would Diogenes be punk rocker is a way to see it? D do you yeah. do you think he would have been someone who would be a good stand up comedian today, where he's good at Probably. talking shit about power and yeah. problems, but a stand up comedian's value to society isn't providing the solution. It's it's to make jokes and point out the cracks yeah. and kind of like open them up and say funny shit while they're doing it do you think he would have been a character like that today definitely 
that's exactly what he does. He's great at that, but you also feel like, okay, that's nice, but how about the next step? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was really, there wasn't the job of stand, I guess there were, there were there jesters in ancient Greece, like something equivalent to stand up yeah. comedian where you, your job was to just tell jokes. Right. I mean, there were people of entertainment have never been lacking. Right. So yeah. it's like you either did it because you wrote plays and you, they could be comedies and that's what you did, yeah. whether as an actor or as a writer, they did it probably more informally like that. So there were definitely things that, uh, and Diogenes was a philosopher slash just crazy guy on the street. And he was just funny, really funny. Yeah. But again, to me, all that intelligence in picking apart the stuff that doesn't work only goes so far if you never bring up stuff, alternatives, if you never offer something else that can work. Yeah, yeah. If you're just you're pointing out the problem and there's no solution, just you right. it's not it's not as useful. Yeah. What what do you think the catalyst was in IQ's life that allowed him to be a guy who rejected the hierarchy, re- rejected the uh, the power structure of Zen uh, Buddhism, but didn't try to go to, like he didn't go down a g- degenerate path himself, like you were saying before. What do you think was that spark in his life that allowed him to do his own thing and inspire people to live a certain way, but he wasn't necessarily trying to build another religion, like b- to build another power dynamic with him at the top. I think it's just, I don't know that there's one factor. I mean, we would have to know a lot more about his life to determine it, but mm-hmm. my guess is that there was no one factor. I think it's a mix of his personality, 10,000 different experiences he went through that shaped him into a person that was uh, different from some mm-hmm. of the people who would uh, feel inclined to go down that path. Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite story or moment from Ikkyu's life that you learned that you enjoy retelling, like something that stands out to you when maybe people who haven't heard about Ikkyu will ask you about them and, and something that pops out, like, oh, you have to know about this. Like, this this is, like, something I mean, that really a, paints a picture of him. There's a bunch. He's, uh, at one point, he falls in love with this uh, singer who was blind. And uh, mm. it's one of the most celebrated romance stories in Japanese history. And that happens when Ikkyu's in his 70s, which is pretty fun in itself. Mm. Um, he, when he's close to dying, at one point he gathers his disciple and he says, uh, after I die, I know some of you are going to take to the mountains to meditate. Some of you are just going to party with women. And he goes, both types of Zen are fine with me. But if you become a yeah. professional cleric and start babbling about the Zen as the way, then you're my enemy. And I thought mm. it's hilarious, right? Because it's like he's comparing a deep meditation in the mountains and a more sensual life. It's like those are v- both viable paths, but uh, intellectualizing all these in a bullshit kind of way and you know, removing it from the reality of what it is because you're trying to build this castle of ideas and it's that I would have a problem with. It's funny, you know. It-